Hello, I'm Professor Steve Miller. Welcome back to Compressible Flow. Today we'll be talking about a number of very interesting topics. The first is the idea of the multiple shock systems. After we talk about multiple shock systems, which can become very complicated, three-dimensional, unsteady, and beautiful, we'll look at the idea of a slip lines, which can form when shocks intersect in these particular systems. We'll then look at the famous lambda shocks, which can also form, which is a different type of shock wave system which we've never seen before, and I think you'll appreciate it very much. We'll then talk about the idea of mock intersections, and we'll introduce this through an application. Of course, we'll return to the supersonic inlets, which we earlier analyzed with the idea of a single normal shock wave inlet for early fighter jets in the 1950s. And of course, with the supersonic wind tunnel examples where we need to swallow shocks. We're going to try and get rid of that problem with, of course, the idea of this shock system for inlets. Let's look at some examples to get started. Here's an early Schlieren image of a typical fighter aircraft inlet prototype. Here the flow moves from left to right. Here the flow is, once again, granulated in a Schlieren. Remember, Schlierens show density gradients within the flow. The black part is the outline of the engine. This part of the image is the cowl or outer part of the engine, and this is an arrow spike. Here you can see there's a family of shock waves, and this is three-dimensional conic shock waves, and the theta beta Mach number equation for a given inlet Mach number with this turning angle theta relative to the incoming flow direction here yields an oblique shock wave with angle beta, which coming is off the tip of this arrow spike. This shock wave exactly matches the outer cowl of the engine. And then another shock wave forms here, and it is turned off off the outside of the engine. So this is the exterior flow in the upper and lower part of the image going around the engine, and then some part of the flow goes through the engine which crosses this particular oblique shock wave. Why is this oblique shock wave carefully placed here? The shape of the arrow spike, its, spike, its angle, and its position exactly places the shock wave so that the shock wave impinges on the leading lip of the inlet of the engine. And this is of course done for efficiency, which we'll show momentarily. In fact, these types of images in the early part of the Cold War were closely guarded because of course the position of the arrow spike and its angle relative to the impingement wave location with the engine cowl lip could be found to see and use a theta beta Mach number equation relation where there's a turning angle and a wave angle. From these two angles, from a sideline view of the engine, of course without any flow at all, just on the ground, you could estimate the Mach number ideally for the engine on the ground. And therefore you could estimate the flight Mach number of the aircraft, which were indeed closely guarded secrets by both the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Let's look at an internal part of this basic geometry for the SR-71 Blackbird, at least a schematic so you can understand it. Indeed, there's an inlet, an isolator, and a combustor. Here, this is the arrow spike of a more advanced engine, and indeed, there's a system of shocks. There's a four-body shock at the arrow spike tip, there's another turning angle where we generate additional shocks, and one of these shocks is designed to come along and hit the tip of the cowl. Then the shock waves, like we showed in the previous class, reflect off the solid walls, and a shock wave boundular interactions happen and boundulars grow in the engine and through the whole arrow spike, which happens in reality. In this class right now, we're not accounting for such interactions, but we'll have to examine them and make sure we capture them later. The shocks form a shock system, or a so-called shock train, inside the inlet duct of the engine, and they bounce around back and forth. In fact, this shock wave is reflected off the tip of the cowl, it's right running, and it reflects off the left running shock and bounces back off the wall again, off the left running shock, becomes a left running shock itself, bounces off the wall, reflected shock, and keeps going through the system until it terminates to, of course, subsonic flow. You'll see through our equations of motion that we lose minimal total pressure through this particular system and raise the static pressure to have very high values through the systems of shocks. This eliminates the need, of course, for a compressor. The compressor, of course, are the rotating fans, rotors, and stators in the inlet of an engine which you see on a commercial aircraft. Its only purpose is to raise the static pressure 
for the purposes of combustion and to create thrust through the bypass. This particular engine has no bypass, and this high pressure, high temperature air located at three is then gone through a particular flame, left body flame holder, and combustion occurs, which is then ejected out, of course, of the nozzle. So this type of engine has no moving parts. It has an inlet, an isolator, and combustor. And indeed, this is a particular type of famous engine, which is used in particular flight vehicles. And its compression mechanism is only done through the knowledge of shock waves. It's a beautiful idea, especially because it has no moving parts. The application of this idea was performed in one of the cycles of the SR-71 Blackbird. Here you can see there's two engines from this flight photo on the left and right. Here's that cowl which I showed in the previous picture, and here's the aero spike. Indeed, as the aircraft accelerates, the turning angle of the spikes remains same, but the wave angle changes depending on the incoming Mach number. And so the aero spikes, as you imagine, would move forward as the aircraft accelerates to achieve lower and lower wave angles with increasing Mach number and given turning angles thetas. Now, it's interesting to analyze this engine, and the idea and the inlet of these engines was actually designed on paper by a team of, of course, engineers and computers, people. Here's a more contemporary flight vehicle, which is the F F-22. You can see in this particular engine inlet on left and right relative to the Blackbird, they don't use aero spikes, but they have, like the F-15 too, basically a lip where an oblique shock wave forms and comes in and forms that same type of shock system inside the engine inlet. The engines themselves are downstream of the inlet. And of course, there's a shock system that's designed to, of course, raise the static pressure and temperature before they're a compressor of the engine. This engine, of course, has a compressor of turbines. And this, of course, is an advantageous relative to having normal shocks in the inlet. Why? Because, of course, there's less losses through the shock system. Basically, all contemporary aircraft are designed with these types of systems for high-performance aircraft. Even commercial aircrafts generally do not have the shock systems they're flying at subsonic speeds. And so this isn't generally a problem. Let's make some notes on these particular inlets to take away. First, we always desire to raise the pressure of the flow with as little losses of total pressure as possible before the compressor bank. The most efficient way to do this at supersonic speeds is to move through a system of oblique shock waves. Now for only slightly supersonic, like Mach 1.05, you can see there's absolutely no problem with this system. But when you move at higher Mach numbers, like say flight Mach number 1.4 and above, then you must have these types of systems to have an efficient engine. Otherwise, you're just wasting away all your fuel and energy on, of course, the losses of shock waves. A single normal shock wave is the most highly inefficient way to, of course, deaccelerate the flow before your compressor phase, and you want to avoid it at all costs. That's why aero spikes, like in the SR-71, or the F-15 or F-22 have these very unique engine inlets where they have formation of oblique shock waves around the inlet to create a shock system. You can also see that this indeed has interesting implications for supersonic wind tunnels within diffusers. It makes much more sense to have a shock system in the diffuser of a supersonic wind tunnel because, of course, it's impossible to have truly isentropic flow in the wind tunnel, especially when you put a model in it. And so diffusers are designed in supersonic wind tunnels to have systems of shocks that are oblique within the diffuser to isentropically raise the pressure that is, recover it in the case of a wind tunnel, and of course have as little losses as possible and avoid normal shocks. Here, a higher total or stagnation pressure recovery results in more efficient engines, and you'll learn more about this, I hope, in your upcoming propulsion classes. Also remember that a smaller change of entropy across many weak oblique shocks will result in a single strong shock. They could be equivalent. However, generally in a shock system, many smaller delta S's will result in a much smaller entropy increase or total pressure loss than one single shock. And you can try out this analysis yourself and we'll try some examples in class.
Let's now return and recall our definitions of the so-called left and right running shock intersections. In the upper left and the upper right, I have two particular left running and right running waves. Imagine you're a little observer and you're looking downstream in the direction of the supersonic flow. And you can see in the upper left, the shock wave moves to your left. In the upper right, the shock wave moves to your right. Indeed, this is why we call them the left and right running waves. You can also see that there's an instantaneous deflection of the streamline, which is drawn as the arrows, from M1 to M2 in both cases. The right running wave will always deflect the flow by an angle theta in the right direction, and on the left, the left running wave will always deflect the flow in the left direction. The general rule of thumb is the flow is always deflected in the same angle as the wave in which it's running. Now what happens when, of course, these two families intersect? Perhaps I'm looking downstream and I have a right running wave, which is moving to the right, towards a left running wave. So I could take this figure and I put it up above the left running wave. So I have two shock waves which are coming together what happens? And of course, the answer is it depends. Here's one particular CFD simulation instead of a Schlieren experiment to illustrate the result. I have an upper wall here. I have a lower wall, which represents perhaps the cowl of something, and it comes and it deflects and goes towards the center of the duct, and then it's has an opposite turning angle here and it becomes parallel with the original wall direction. Now there's some perturbation here. It could be a little problem with the wall, a small cavity or perturbation or something, and it creates a shock wave. In the CFD, we basically force a shock wave to form here, but we could also have a wall which turns into the flow of the opposite case, which I'll show in this very class. Now you'll see in this particular case, that a right running wave, shock wave forms here, we'll call that three, and a left running wave forms down here. So the left, right, and left waves come in and they intersect. And indeed, they reflect as a reflected left running and right running wave respectively at the shock intersection. Now there's particular contours as this is a contour plot from CFD. The contour legend here is here. It's the magnitude of nabla P, the static pressure in the flow. And here's the color legend. For example, up here we have 3,619 magnitude of nabla P. And that's shown as the dark red colors. The white signifies that there's basically no pressure gradients, which makes sense. There's high pressure gradients along the shock. In fact, the maximum pressure gradients occur at the shock locations, and that's why they're this deep, deep red color. They've also shown some streamlines. Look at the streamline in the lower left part of the figure. It comes along and it's immediately deflected in the left direction according to the shock, and it comes up and it's deflected again through a relatively weak reflection of the reflected right running shock from the left running shock wave and returns generally parallel to the original flow direction. The same thing happens in the upper wall. The flow comes in and is immediately deflected to the right, the streamline, and then it's reflected again through a very interesting flow phenomenon, which we're not talking about right now, back towards the flow and it eventually becomes re-paralyzed to the wall. Now in here you can actually see there's a recirculation zone. This means these streamlines are recirculating and the flow is trapped in a large eddy or vortex by the wall. This can lead to higher aerodynamic heating because of course this flow is very hot and has nowhere to go and it heats up the wall. Nonetheless, it is an interesting flow phenomenon for the steady case. And you can see from the CFD example what might happen in one particular shock example. Let's look at another examples and then analysis. Here's a diagram of a very similar case using the theories we developed in this class. And I label this as figure 266, which is the schematic of the intersecting shocks. We have two parallel walls, and each wall is immediately turned into itself. The flow turns into itself by angles theta 2 and theta 3, respectively. So it's an incoming supersonic flow of some significant Mach number. We'll call that state 1. Now the lower wall has a turning angle of theta 2. The upper wall has a turning angle of theta 3. In this particular diagram, theta 2, the turning angle for the left running incident wave, 
and theta three, the turning angle of the right running incident wave, are not equal. Theta two is not equal to theta three. But the Mach number in front of these two turning angles is the same. Therefore, according to the theta beta Mach number equation, if there's particular solutions for the weak waves, we'll get a corresponding right running and left running wave B and A respectively. You'll notice that the angles, say beta sub A and beta sub B, are indeed different because theta 3 and theta 2 are different respectively. Indeed, through geometry you can find those angles beta and you'll see that they indeed intersect at point E. And behind A and B you'll have corresponding new flow properties 2 and 3. What happens at E? Well, indeed, the shocks are reflected just like in our CFD simulation and of course visualizations. And you'll see behind that left running reflected shock D and the right running reflected shock C from the left and right running waves respectively, we'll have new properties 4 and 4 prime. Now since theta 2 and theta 3 are not equal and we have different wave angles of incident waves and different wave angles say beta C and beta D relative to the incoming flow directions, they won't be equal. What happens? The properties in 4 and 4 prime will indeed be not equal, but they must be parallel because they reside in the same flow regime according to conservation of mass principles. So they have different properties, but the velocities are parallel. That means the thermodynamic properties in region 4 behind the reflected waves and 4 prime behind the right running family of reflected wave must be different. For example, the pressures, densities, and temperatures might be different, but which ones are different and which ones are equal? We'll find this out in a few minutes. You'll also notice that the new deflections after the reflections must all be the same. It's just separated by what we call a slip line, which is our new kind of fluid dynamic phenomena that forms in this particular situation. And let's learn about the physics of the beautiful slip line, which represents a discontinuity in the flow of inviscid equations of motion where the velocities are equal, excuse me, the velocities are unequal, but the fluid dynamic thermodynamic properties might be different. So let's make some notes about this diagram and flip back and forth just to solidify these important points. And you're welcome in your own notes to write these down, as they should be, of course, memorized. Now, if theta 2 is greater than theta 3, or vice versa, then shocks at A are stronger than B, or vice versa. So of course, theta 2 is greater than theta 3. That means the shock A is stronger. It has a larger total pressure loss than the shock across B. The streamlines will indeed undergo different entropy generation in the flows. For example, the entropy in 4 and 4 prime are different. Why? Because the wave angles are different and have correspondingly different entropy generations. So the entropy in 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4 prime are all likely different in the situation in general. Of course, we can set theta 2 to theta 3, and then we would have the equal entropy in 2 and 3 and 4 and 4 prime. In fact, if theta 3 and theta 2 were equal, then region 4 would only be 4 and there would be no 4 primes. They'd all be equal with equal thermodynamic properties and velocities. The slip line is actually a discontinuity in entropy. So the change in entropy is instantaneous across the slip line from 4 to 4 prime. Just like a shock wave might be viewed as a discontinuity in an inviscid flow, the slip line is a discontinuity in the inviscid flow. The pressure across the slip line must indeed be constant. Why is this? Otherwise, there'd be a curvature in the slip line. Just like we would have a curvature in a streamline which is curved, we can find with its radius of curvature some pressure changes with respect to velocity. You can imagine the slip line is constant straight line and therefore the pressure across it is zero. It's the same theory and principles but for compressible flows that you learned in your incompressible classes but of course with compressibility effects built in. You can see in this particular case, which is very interesting, that since it's a straight line, the pressure must be constant across, but we have a different entropy. This probably means that we have different densities and temperatures according to the ideal gas law. The velocities across the slip line between 4 and 4 prime are in the same direction but have different magnitudes, as I just mentioned. Therefore, the properties with known theta and theta 2 and theta 3 completely determine the flow. If we know theta 2, if we know theta 3 and we know the properties of thermodynamics 
and the velocity in one, we can completely find the flow and thermodynamic and velocity properties in all other states of the system and the locations of the shock waves and the reflections only from this knowledge. Indeed, this is why it's called a marching problem, because we know the properties at one and we march downstream, in this case left to right, to find properties at two and three and then four and four prime. It's marching. We march from cell to cell, shock cell to shock cell, if you will. In fact, this forms its own type of shock cell structure or system of shocks inside the duct. It's beautiful. Finally, remember the thermodynamic values in 4 and 4 prime are different except for the static pressure, which is across the shock line. These problems are actually easy to solve if you remember the physics, and it's the exact same set of equations, the theta, beta, Mach number equations, as we march downstream in the flow. Let's look at another shock family which might form these types of flows. This is the so-called intersection of shocks of the same family, and these are indeed lambda shocks. Now we looked at what happens when a left running shock and a right running shock intersect. But have you indeed considered what happens when two shocks, which are perhaps moving in the left or right direction, merge? Well, they coalesce and become an even more interesting shock. Let's look at this for a particular different Mach numbers of the so-called lambda shock. In Schlieren's, here the flow is moving left to right, and there's a little point up here which is not important in the flow. What it matters is this lower wall and its structure. You can see subtle changes in the incoming Mach number and the sh structure and shape of the wall will create different shock systems. In fact, and let's look at the lower left one first. There is, in fact, a shape where a normal shock is at the top part of the Schlieren, and it's attached to the wall by an oblique shock and another weaker shock after it. Indeed, you can see in this Schlieren, if you look carefully, there's a small shear layer. That is actually the slip line. You can see the slight line in the figure. In the other cases where the lambda shock is a little bit different shape, you can see the same slip line where I'm moving my cursor right now. Now, it's called a lambda shock, obviously, because it sh looks very much like lambda, the Greek symbol, small lambda, which I'm moving my cursor around in figure 267 in the slide uh, caption, lambda shocks for different conditions. You can see the little lambda shape is shown in each of the Schlieren, reversed. But of course, I could take the picture from the other direction and also see the lambda, which is in the correct direction from left to right, at least. But who would we to say if we should read top to bottom, left to right, or right to left? Nonetheless, you'll see here we have an oblique shock, a weak second leg of the lambda, and a normal shock. And by changing the directions and wall, we can change the structure of the shock. For example, in the middle section, you can see a very, very strong lambda shock, which terminates in the middle, and there's the slip line. This slip line has the exact same type of properties as we previously discussed. Let's look at some more examples and analysis of the famous lambda shock, which you can, of course, analyze with a combination of normal shock theory for the normal shock and oblique shock theory for the two, of course, legs of the lambda. This is a different case now, which we call a corner oblique shock in figure 268. Earlier, I showed the single oblique shock wave attached to the corner B. Now, say there's two other points, A and C. In this case, we only deflect the flow angle by theta with supersonic flow in front of the shock, which is M1 greater than 1, and we go from state 1 to 2. There's angles lambda 1 and, excuse me, mu 1 and mu 2. What are mu 1 and mu 2? They are, of course, the Mach wave angles. In this particular diagram, the Mach waves are intersecting the shock wave. That is, the Mach waves before and after the shock are coalescing excuse me, coalescing with the oblique shock wave itself. The shock wave has an angle beta. Let's analyze this particular case. With in mind, what happens to the Mach waves? Do they always coalesce with the shock? Let's consider the two cases independently. We'll consider the case first where the Mach waves are also generated by the wall, which is a normal phenomenon. Look at the Schlieren and the Lambda cases and try and see where, of course, the Mach waves are generated. You might see them faintly in the images if you have a high enough definition monitor, and of course, the video compression didn't remove them. So we see and postulate that the Mach waves must intersect the shock because of the following analysis. Let's look at state one first. 
first, v sub 1 equals w1 beta 1, where v and w, of course, are our traditional tangential and normal velocities with respect to the shock wave written with a sign of beta. Look at the particular state 1 for these coordinates. You can see through trigonometry that sine of beta must be v1 over w1, and therefore sine mu1, the sine of, indeed, the angle of the Mach wave, must be c1 over w1. Now compare sine beta with sine mu1 for v1 over w1 and c1 over w1. We know, indeed, that v1 must be greater than c1, of course, because it's a supersonic flow and there's a shock wave, and the normal shock wave component must be supersonic. Remember, v is the component of the velocity in front of the shock divided by C1, MN1. Recall that from our first class on oblique shock waves. So what does this mean? This implies indeed that beta must be greater than mu1 given our relations of sine beta v1 over w1 and sine mu1 as c1 over w1. Therefore, that wave angle of mu1 must be shallower than beta and no matter what, the wave, the Mach wave, given enough propagation distance in the left running direction must intersect and coalesce with the oblique shock wave. What happens to the Mach wave after the shock wave in state 2? We can do the exact same analysis. Here V2 will be W2 of sine beta minus theta, which of course we derived in our first classes on shock waves. And of course sine beta minus theta will go to V2 over W2, and for the Mach wave sine of mu2 will go as C2 over U2. Try and derive these trigonomic relations on your own. They're very straightforward. Now we look at the normal components after the oblique shock will always be subsonic, and therefore V2 will always be less than C2, as M2N is V2 over C2. This will imply from 525 that beta minus theta is always less than mu2. Therefore, if you substitute this in and see that beta minus theta is always less than mu2, you can come to the same conclusion, but the opposite case, that the Mach wave angle will always be greater than the shock wave angle relative to the flow direction, which of course is the turning angle theta from A, B, C. Therefore, that Mach wave, no matter what, if there's enough room in the left running direction before reflection or termination in the shock wave, will always coalesce. And the Mach waves before and after the shock waves for these traditional problems will always intersect and coalesce in the wave. We call this coalescence. Coalescence occurs when one or more waves merge and become a stronger or different wave. Here's one beautiful idea and example of a very complicated shock family. You can almost call this a lambda shock, but it's much more complicated. From left to right we see a Schlieren, and we're visualizing density gradients. Here the photograph has been quantified by taking the density gradient, which is the Schlieren image itself of course, and quantifying it from a scale. So you can see here's the shock wave left running. And here's two particular shock waves which are left running. And there's a reflection in the slip lines and a reflection from this shock wave into another slip line. And this is all unsteady, of course. In reality, especially near the wall, there's a turbulent boundary layer. And we would expect the shocks, the turbulence, all to be moving along with the expansions and the flow. It's beautiful, and we can make high-speed movies of this, which I might show in class if we have time. Nonetheless, let's look at two left running oblique shock waves. They're initially, off the diagram, off the picture, from the Schlieren mirrors, there's an initial incident left running wave and another incident left running wave which is separated from this turbulent boundary layer and they intersect and form a new left running shock waves. And so this here is our classic lambda shock problem. Behind that lambda shock there's an oblique shock wave, the top of the lambda, and the two legs and that forms a slip line which you see here as this density gradient. This forms and separates due to another shock system downstream with the slip lines. And of course it forms a very strong oblique shock wave which is curved that goes off into the flow. And it has a slight curvature so you may only approximate it with planar oblique shock wave or conic shock wave theory. In reality this would have to be handled with computational fluid dynamics because the corner is so complicated. Nonetheless, I've already talked about the shock cell system behind this wave and its complicated nature. You can amaze, be amazed and think about the full Stokes equations and their solution for this complicated problem. 
it's very difficult. But with our simple tools, you can try and find a steady solution in this particular case with the two left running lambda shock wave, which terminates and forms and coalesces into this reflected wave that goes off to the ambient. Let's now look at the extension of the Mach intersection theory and look at the lambda shock itself. This is an idealization of the previous two figures. We'll have a double turning angle. The flow will come in from left to right parallel to the wall and the flow will be turned at an angle theta 2 at point A. Then the flow will be turned again at point B by an angle theta 3. Notice theta 2 and theta 3 are both defined relative to the initial flow direction. But the flow in region 2, of course, will be parallel to the wall AB. And so the flow turning angle at point B from 2 to 3 will be less than theta 3. Note that in the particular notation of the problem, which is important when analyzing the theta beta Mach number equation and relation. So the flow comes in and we're turned at angle theta two and a left running attached oblique shock wave will be located at, at point A and it'll go to the left. The Mach number has slowed down and another turning angle occurs and another oblique shock wave will form at B and it'll be a left running wave. From the previous analysis, we can also see that these two left running waves unless there's something different happening in the wall from A to B, must coalesce, and they'll coalesce at some point C. So one particular shock wave, which is left running, will coalesce with another, as long as there's a straight wall and no other flow physics is happening in region two. These will merge and be located at point C. At point C, where two left running shock waves coalesce, they will coalesce and become a new left running oblique shock wave, which we'll call shock wave CD, and that will occur between regions one and five as shown on the figure. There'll also be a reflected wave, which goes in the right direction from point C, and that'll go from C to E. Behind E, that is the reflected wave change of the flow from three to four, indeed, there'll be another flow through dynamics phenomena, even though indeed the streamline is not changing as long as the wall remains parallel to the reflection when E hits the wall in region three and four, which is not shown on the figure. There could indeed be another turning angle into or out of the flow at E, which might alter region four. Nonetheless, in this diagram, just like in the Schlieren, which I showed here, there is indeed a slip line or shear layer forming at the root of the lambda itself. This slip line is shown as differences between regions three and four as the dotted line. Remember the slip line has velocities which are parallel but unequal. Indeed, the pressures will be equal and equalized, but the other thermodynamic values, temperature and of course density will be different. Now look at the streamlines. The streamline which goes from across the CD is turned through one flow deflection angle, which is equal to the total flow deflection angle at angles A and B. In fact, its angle is theta sub three, which is the total turning angle of the flow in this double corner. You'll also see there's another slip line that go, or excuse me, streamline, which goes from one to two to two to three, and then across the reflected wave, which might also bend the streamline a third time. But indeed, across every shock, the streamlines are instantaneously turned by the discontinuity in the flow field, which are the shock waves. Let's make some observations about the particular Mach wave and lambda waves for the Mach intersection of two left running oblique shock waves. Also note that the same flow phenomena happens if there's two right running waves in the double corner. We see the formation of the famous lambda shock wave. Two left running oblique shock waves occur in each turn of the flow and merge. Region 5's properties are governed by a single oblique shock wave as shown in figure 270 of the slide deck. You also note that there's two left running waves and they merge and coalesce into a single shock wave. Region four will be governed by the two shock waves between one and two and two and three, and three and four for the reflected wave. 
of course you know certain properties that the velocity vectors are parallel between 4 and 5 and of course the pressures are equal. You can indeed march downstream in this problem and find the wave angles from 1 to 5 because of course you must match the static pressures from 1 to 4. The entropy difference will always occur across the streamline, which of course will translate into a temperature difference with equal pressures. Some more notes on the problem. Remember, there's different thermodynamic values across the particular shock. The velocity vector will be in the same direction across the slip line, but be equal. It will originate at point C, where the two waves merge. Now, it is possible for P4 not to be equal to P5 directly at the intersection, and in reality you might see some curvature of the slip line right at the intersection and coalescence of the waves before the formation of the left and right reflected waves. Now indeed, we will enforce P4 to e be equal to P5 slightly downstream of the intersection, and therefore the turning angles are also the same because the velocity vectors are equal, and there's no turning of the particular system. Now if we are unable physically or mathematically to match P4 or P5, that is there's another boundary condition in the problem, then of course there will be a curvature of the slip line, and indeed we see that in these particular problems. We just aren't illustrating this example yet because it's under, it's beyond the current scope of the class. Now generally, the system we're seeing right here is solved numerically for system waves C, D, and C, E. C, C, D, and C, E waves, they are solved numerically with respective wave angles to match the pressure across the slip line. And so it's very difficult to solve these problems with a little bit of extra knowledge. On paper and analytically, I might give you a little clue on how to do that. Otherwise, you have to solve the problem numerically. Let's make some more interesting notes on the mock reflections or shockwave reflections. Could I, please consider the reflection of a right running incident shockwave near a wall. It will indeed bounce off the wall once again as wave B. So incident wave is right running wave A and reflected wave is left running labeled B. The flow is parallel to the wall in the first region it's moving towards the wall and deflected here in the notation of small delta towards the wall by the wave angle and then once again it's deflected at a negative angle delta after the reflected wave. We might look at these particular angles and label them as beta and beta minus delta respectively across the wave system. Where of course beta 1 and beta 2 are the relative angles of the waves with respect to the flow directions. Remember that angles of the waves beta and the turning angles theta, for example, are always relative to the local flow direction and, uh, before each shock wave. The streamlines in this case are parallel to the wall except behind the incident wave. This of course continuity must force the streamline after the reflected wave to be parallel to the wall. Now in this case, in this diagram, the theta beta Mach number equations for the planar shock waves indeed always have a solution. And then we find oblique shock waves to the wall. But you might imagine what happens when the theta beta Mach number does not have a particular solution for an angle beta and Mach number relative to the wall. Then we have some problem because we cannot solve our equations. Indeed, a different wave system forms. In fact, we'll see an attachment on the wall of a different type. If we have a solution for theta beta Mach number equation for the reflected shot case of the right running case on the wall, we can visualize it in this case. Here the incident shock wave has a solution where theta is less than theta max. And we've plotted on this case an x-axis of the flow deflection angle and the y-axis the respective beta 1, beta 2 wave angles of figure 271. You can see here for each case M1, there's a particular theta. Theta in one case, you can see is less than theta max and therefore theta beta Mach number equation has a solution and we have incident reflected oblique shock waves on the wall. Now, for the second wave, we also need a deflection angle which of course will be less than theta sub max for two, for M2. If not, then a problem occurs. In fact, for theta sub two, the turning angle for the second wave, we would want to be less than theta two max, which would be located right here, which is not shown in this particular figure. 
Now, what happens indeed if the flow turning angle here, theta, is greater than theta max? You know that we can't have an attached reflected wave. In fact, it will form something like an inverse lambda shock, where the top of the lambda will be at the wall, and the top part of the lambda, that's its head, will be a normal shock. So you'll have an incident wave, which reflects into a reflected wave, and a normal shock will be attached to the wall. We'll show pictures of this later in the class, where you have a theta greater than theta max for the reflected wave problem. So be aware of this when you're analyzing problems. Now let's make a quick note about the so-called idea of these flows for fun. You'll see in certain diagrams and graphic arts that you can see that certain waves are painted in. For example, look at the United States Post Office graphic in the lower right of figure 274. You can see that lines are drawn around the eagle head to designate speed and give speed to the viewer. There's many graphic designs which show these types of lines around uh, perhaps birds or devices to, to, to show speed. In fact, if you look at the NASA emblem, you can see there's particular swoops which designate speed for aeronautics. Now remember, as the Mach number decreases, the Mach angle increases, the wave angle of the Mach, the Mach waves or the shock wave, which designates slower speed flow. So just by our own physical intuition in our culture, we have drawn in waves closer to the vehicles to show sweeping. A highly swept wave indicates higher speed, which is good for a company's of course. Here's some more thoughts to consider. Remember, the Mach wave and the Mach number, excuse me, the Mach number always decreases across a shock, no matter what, but it could be supersonic or subsonic according to the theta beta Mach number equation. Multiple shocks of the same family in the flow must always become progressively weaker and less swept back. So if we go through a shock system, we would expect beta to be increasing as we march downstream. This means and implies for the same shock family, left or right running, that they always must coalesce. Remember, coalescence is where shocks merge and come together and perhaps become a shock with different properties. Remember, this happens physically for two major reasons, as we've seen mathematically too. The shock angles tend to become progressively swept back, and each new wave angle will always be measured from the change flow direction after the shock wave in front of it. Let's look at some examples to solidify these particular concepts. Here, we'll have a flow which is incoming at Mach 3, and gamma 1.4, which is the ratio of specific heats. And the flow will go over the double wedge and form a lambda shock. This is so-called compression corner and could be seen on particular inlets like we looked at on the SR-71 diagram. Here, we'll have two turning angles, theta 1 and theta 2, which will be 10 degrees. And the length between in the streamlined direction of these particular angles and turning points between one and two and two and three will be five centimeters, 0 0.05 meters. And we're asked to determine, relative to figure 275 below, the height h of the oblique shock coalescence point, which is shown in four, figure 275. So that's the distance from the center line, or the initial center line, plane of symmetry of the flow, to h, that's the distance from the center line to shock coalescence, which is right here to the wall. We're then asked to find the Mach number in region three near the wall and the Mach region number four after the coalescence of the two left running waves from one to two and two to three source location. So here in the diagram, note that some people call the wave angles theta one and theta two and the flow diffraction angles delta one and delta two. I've tried to transform this into our traditional theta beta Mach number coordinates. Just know that other people sometimes use alternative notation which I've tried to make consistent in the class, but of course it's not always possible. So let's look from one to two to two to three, and from one to four to try and solve this problem. We first need to identify the particular shock angles beta one and beta two, which are of course in the diagram theta one and theta two. Notice how beta two or theta two is found from the flow deflection angle from one to two, right here. We can do that by looking at beta one, and finding it from the oblique shock calculator. We know the incoming Mach number, which is three, and we know the flow deflection angle, which is 10 degrees. We can then find through the theta beta Mach number equation, 
27.4 degrees, which is the angle of the first wave. And we find the Mach number after it, which is 2.51 degrees, so we know M2. We can now find the wave angle from 2 to 3, which is beta 2, at Mach 2, 2.51, which is the Mach number in 2. And we know the flow deflection angle is again, of course, 10 degrees. We can then solve the theta beta Mach number equations again and find a new wave angle of 31.9 degrees and a Mach number M3 of 2.09. Notice from M1, 3, to M2, 2.51, to M3, we have decreasing Mach number all the way to 2.09. Also note that the wave angle beta 1 is less than beta 2, which makes physical sense, of course, because the Mach numbers decreased. If you don't find these decreasing Mach number values and increasing wave angle values, respectively, you know you've made a mistake because we're in the same family of curves, or if you will, theta beta Mach number equations, left running or right running families of waves. Remember, beta 2 is measured from the flow direction. That is this particular line right here on figure 275 of the slide deck. Now remember that beta 2 is measured from that direction, and therefore we can solve for h using simple trigonometry or graphically. You know the locations of the two angles, and you know the angles of the waves. You can draw straight lines and find the value of h graphically, or better yet, solve the trigonometric system, which, uh, geometric system, excuse me, which you can do analytically. I encourage you to do that yourself. It's basic high school mathematics. And you'll find a value of 4.87 centimeters above the center line axis of the problem, the x-axis, 4.87 centimeters. Let's continue our problem and see properties in region five, of course. Now remember, the Mach number in region 3 has already been found, and we found it to be 2.09. And that was obtained by doing the marching problem. That is, we stepped downstream through the two initial oblique shock waves. We now need the Mach number in region 4, which of course is different from region 3. And how do we do this? Let's try now. Remember, the flow in region 4 has passed through only one shock wave, which was the coalescence of the two incident shock waves moving to the left, which is right here in region 4. And it's separated by a slip line from 3. Now the coalesced shock wave will indeed have a Mach number M1 of 3, because the Mach number in front of 1 to 2 and 1 to 4 is still 3. And we know it's a left running wave and it has a total turning angle of 20 degrees, which is the turning angle of 10 degrees plus 10 degrees, which created 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 shock wave, oblique shock wave. We can then directly solve the theta beta Mach number charts and find and 4 for a theta 20 degrees turning angle and wave angle, of course, we're looking for. And we'll find beta from 1 to 4. That's the angle of this wave relative to, of course, the flow, initial flow direction here, which is 20 degrees of 37.8 degrees. You can look up and test my work if you wish you'll see that indeed 37.8 degrees is a very unique angle relative to the first beta 1 and beta 2. You'll also then find, of course, M4. You'll see M4 is indeed 1.99, which is less than M3. And so you have different Mach numbers in region 3 and 4, which is expected. Indeed, you also have different speeds of sounds and temperatures. Now this example illustrates a few important concepts which I really want you to understand. First, there's flow discontinuities which will occur when parts of the flow passes through different combinations of shock waves. In particular, we have a slip line between regions three and four. These flow velocities, entropies, densities, and temperatures are all different. The flow is indeed in the same direction, which is enforced by continuity, especially for inviscid equations of motion for steady problems. It has been turned through a total angle of 20 degrees. In fact, in regions 3 and 4, they've both been turned through the same turning, total turning angle. 4 instantaneously went through the turning angle of 20 degrees, and region 3 went through two increments of 10 degrees. You could also vary theta 1 and theta 2, that is the two independent turning angles, to find an infinite number of different types of slip line properties. Remember, the flow is higher at Mach number in 3 than 4. Why? Because, of course, we went through two weaker shocks relative to the single shock of the coalesced waves. So the shock wave strengths have increased with increasing incoming Mach number 
across a single wave instead of two slightly weaker waves. This really illustrates the concept of supersonic inlets, indeed, and why we might have smaller increments in turning angles. So remember this, by turning the flow through two small increments or many increments, there will be less losses than turning the flow through the entire 20 degree increment in one particular jump. That's a beautiful piece of physics and helps explain why we design supersonic inlets the way we do today, or supersonic diffusers in supersonic wind tunnels. Now remember, we can also vary the total pressure in region one and regions three. We now know the Mach numbers across the waves and their wave angles, therefore we can find the normal Mach numbers across 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 1 to 4. Using these, we can of course then write the total pressure ratios with our equations. The total pressure ratio will be losses. So we can calculate the total pressure loss from 1 to 3 as PO3 over PO1. So that's like a shockwave strength almost. It's not, not really, it's total pressure loss. And we can write that out by multiplying by PO2 over PO2. And we can write PO3 over PO2 times P over 2 over PO1, which we can solve with MN1 and MN2, for example, across 1 and 2 and 2 and 3. And we'll get 0 0.976 and 0 0.9. 6, 3 respectively. Multiplying through we'll get 0 0.940. So that's the total total pressure loss across the system 1 to 3. Now let's find the same for the system across the classic problem like we did previously for the loss of total pressure across the single shock wave from 1 to 4. This will have a value of 0 0.114. So you can see indeed using PO3 and OPO1 I can find a percent difference and you'll see indeed that there's only a 14.4 percent loss P0 through two weak shocks. So remember the total pressure loss across the single shock of the coalescence of shocks is 0.114. That's only 14.4 percent of the total pressure. That's horrible. On the other hand, by going through only two shocks, we're at 0.94 total pressure of P1, which is remarkable. And there's a huge percentage change between this particular shock wave for total pressure recovery in an inlet. Let's look at another Schlieren just to illustrate this concept. This is the exact problem we solved, but with M equals 2. And you can exactly repeat the analysis here. Now you see there's two turning angles with an incoming Mach number of 2. This is Regent 1, this is Regent 2, and this is Regent 3. Here's the slip line, and this is Regent 4. This is the coalesced oblique shock wave, and this is the first and second incident left running shock waves which coalesce into it. You can also see there's a very, very faint streak here, which of course is reflected waves. These granular motions, of course, are Mach waves. Look at how these Mach waves are coalescing with these shocks, as we explained earlier in the class. Of course these have coalesced and there's not enough room for say these downstream left running Mach waves to coalesce with the oblique shock. In fact they're terminated and reflected by the slip line which changes the property of the slip line which we have not accounted for in this class. Notice this problem and now you could actually just look at this picture and knowing Mach 2 find the Mach numbers and also thermodynamic pressures and total pressure losses in regions 2, 3, and 4 of the lambda system. Let's now look at and think about particular properties of the slip line. Remember, behind the lambda shock or coalescence of shock waves, there's almost always slip lines forming in practice. They are above and below the entropy difference and they have a velocity difference. It could be seen as a high speed shear layer. The flow direction and static pressures must be the same across the slip line, but remember it's a slip line and the streamlines are parallel. The velocity slip indeed causes a local normal velocity gradient. In reality, just like shock waves, slip lines also have a thickness due to the viscous forces and heat conduction within the flow. This allows viscosity to become a dominant term and instability occurs, and indeed we see the formation of the classic Kelvin Helmholtz vorticities or instability waves, as shown in figure 277 on the bottom of the slide. Here you'll see a Schlieren behind a lambda shock intersection of the particular growing slip line. So here the slip line is a rather laminar and thick 
and you can see it through its density gradients, but then little waves start to form in the slope line. That's because the flow is unstable, and the instability is named after, of course, Lord Kelvin's excuse me, Lord Kelvin, and of course, Professor Helmholtz. These, we call these waves in slip lines or shear layers or jet flows, the so-called Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. And if you are curious about the formation and physics of these, you can study them, of course, in some graduate classes on instability theory of fluid dynamics, which is an extremely difficult mathematical subject. Let's now look at the so-called families of oblique shock wave reaction or reflections. And we have, up to this only point, looked at the flat solid wall. Let's look at case A in figure 278 for the three types of shock reflections. This is so-called irregular reflection of a right running wave on a solid boundary. And you can see this is the case we analyzed in this class. The exact same type of thing might happen for a left running wave. In this case, we have a supersonic flow which is turned by an angle theta and reflects and is turned back again by the same deflection angle. And you know in this class that in fact beta two must be greater than beta one because of course the Mach number is decreasing across the shock system. Now what happens when our oblique shock wave intersects with say a shear layer or a slip line or a free jet boundary? This is pictured in part B which alludes to the next module of this class. Here we have a supersonic flow with a right running oblique shock wave. And there's a free boundary across that slip line or shear layer, there's another pressure. That pressure could be set so that the reflected wave is now no longer a shock, but an expansion wave, which is the opposite phenomenon of a shock wave. We draw that expansion wave as a series of dotted lines. The dotted lines are designed to match the static pressure across the particular shear layer boundary. Of course, the reflection in the left direction is now no longer a shock. This is because, indeed, the turning angle is different to match the static pressures. That is where we have a fluid dynamic boundary of a shear layer or slip line instead of a solid wall. The third case is the one where we might have a solid wall, and indeed I have a so-called mock stem. This is really the normal shock wave, which occurs when a right running wave reflects as a left running wave, but at the wall the theta beta Mach number equation is invalid. In this case, a slip line forms at, of course, the Mach wave or shock wave intersection which travels downstream. Behind that normal shock wave I'll have a subsonic flow and behind the oblique left running reflected wave I'll have a supersonic flow. Take a few minutes and consider the physics of this slide carefully. Is indeed there's a lot going on here and you'll have to understand these problems for the future homeworks. We'll learn to do the expansion problem of course in the next part of this class. So remember, when a shock wave reflects off a of free boundary, it can indeed reflect as an expansion wave, or in certain cases, a shock wave, given some particular boundary conditions of the flow. Now, these particular oblique shock waves indeed change families from right, lefting, right running to left running waves, respectively. For example, if an oblique shock wave reflects from a solid boundary as an oblique shock wave of the opposite family, but it will usually, not always, I can actually force it to do other things, reflect as a shock wave off of a free boundary as an opposite family wave. So in the upper left, I show a diagram with lower left Schlieren in figure 279 from, of course, Liebman, who was at Caltech. The incoming num Mach number is 1.45, and the flow diffraction angle is 4.5 degrees. We get a right-running oblique shock wave, which bounces off the solid wall as a left-running oblique shock wave. This is illustrated in the upper left. We have a right and left-running reflected waves with turning angles theta 1 equal to theta 2, excuse me, delta 1 equal to delta 2, respectively, with, of course, theta 3, the wave angle, being greater than theta 1. So, of course, beta 3 is greater than theta i in this case. Let's look at the changing of families, which alludes to our next module. Here we'll have a slip line or a shear layer. In the lower right, we see an off-designed supersonic jet exhaust. That's from a nozzle, a converging diverging nozzle. Here's the nozzle face and here's the supersonic flow out of the nozzle. A shock wave forms at the nozzle lip which comes in and reflects as a right running reflected wave. 
Here's a normal shock. The flow in this part of the figure is subsonic, and the flow in this part in the system of oblique shocks is supersonic. The right running oblique shock wave reflects off this part of the flow, which is a supersonic shear layer, which is turbulent. It reflects off as an expansion wave here where my cursor is moving. So that's an expansion wave, and this is a right running shock wave. It's illustrated here in the upper part of the problem. Below the slip line, we have an ambient pressure, say P sub A or P sub infinity with Mach zero. The supersonic flow is greater than one. Where my cursor is here in the diagram corresponds to where my cursor is here in the Schlieren photo. There's a right running oblique shock wave, which is the reflected shock wave in the photo right here. You can see at this intersection, the shock wave intersects the shear layer and reflects off of an expansion. Behind the expansion, the pressure is matched with the ambient. And so here, this new flow phenomena, which we haven't discussed yet, except in the shock piston tube problem, has matched the static pressure with the environment. And in fact, you can see that in the Schlieren, the whole flow field has turned in a downward direction. In fact, the expansion accelerates the flow to a higher Mach number, which is opposite of an oblique shock wave phenomena, which lowers the Mach number. Let's look at a closer view of these types of phenomena. Here's one particular lambda shock, just so you can understand the shock intersections. In this case, you can see a very weak slip line behind it, but there's no expansions forming in this particular flow. This is the so-called Mach reflection or Mach disk problem, which we illustrate in the dust jet problem. In a jet flow where there's a normal shock forming in the jet, we call that the barrel shock. So the normal shock in a jet flow or rocket engine flow, which you can see in videos of rockets taking off sometimes in the shock cell structure, is called a barrel shock. Physically, it's actually a circle and the circular surface exists within the three-dimensional time-dependent flow field formed from, of course, an axisymmetric rocket engine nozzle. In this class, we looked at the idea of shock families and how complicated our theories can become. We then introduced the idea of a slip line, which of course are turbulent shear layers in practice. They become turbulent through the calvin helmholtz instability, which we illustrated. We then looked at lambda shocks and reflected shocks and shock corners and illustrated this through multiple examples. We also examined inlets and the design of inlets and gave one example for where the total pressure loss is only about 95% percent for a double corner relative to the single oblique shock which had only a 14 percent total pressure after it. We then looked at the intersection of these shocks and alluded to our next module on expansion waves which are the opposite phenomena and accelerate the flow unlike the shock wave. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.